morning. Thank you, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Jane, and thank you the IFA for the opportunity. It's great to uh, it's great to be here and be online. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about um, aging 2.0 through the lens of the uh, age-friendly environments um, and give you a little bit of context um, to what aging 2.0 is. Uh, and then specifically, I want to spend a little bit of time introducing a new concept we've just launched called the Aging 2.0 uh, Grand Challenges. Um, and this is uh, really a way for us to for a way for us to uh, focus um, the entire network and the community of innovators that we have uh, developed in um, over 20 countries on sort of key topics. And double click on two that uh, I think would be most interesting for this audience, um, specifically um, improving functional uh, ability and enhancing age-friendly environments. Uh, and then I wanted to finish up by sharing just a few ways in which we can all sort of help um, to uh, have innovation happening so in our local communities and, and getting involved and really showing that this is a, a bottom-up uh, initiative. So with that, I'm just going to uh, jump in um, and uh, I will uh, sort of, I guess, sorry, we've got quite a lot to get through. Just a very quick um, background, you know, we are used to seeing slides uh, when it comes to uh, sort of aging presentations around pyramids. And this one I like because it's not the, the standard um, aging uh, pyramid, but it is something from the, the World Health Organization showing the speed uh, of, by which populations are aging um, and showing that you know, it took France over 110 years to shift from 7% of its population being over 65 to 14%. And that uh, shift is now much quicker happening in countries like South Korea, China, and Thailand uh, in a much more accelerated uh, way. And I think this is interesting as we think about the way that um, countries are aging. Um, the solution that we at Aging 2.0 are taking is that this technology and startups are a very good way to, to, to catch up with the speed of innovation that is necessary as we're seeing this fundamental shift. Um, so just sort of but taking a step back, you know, why does all this matter? And a quick story as to um, how this is relevant and what this means for, for individuals. And I um, wanted to introduce June, June Fisher. And June is somebody that we call our uh, chief elder officer, our CEO. And she's somebody who came into our offices um, a couple of years ago and said, hey, I know, uh, see what you're doing around aging. I thought in the, um, in the local paper, I want you to make sure that you always you know, include me when it comes to making solutions, you know, don't design, you know, for me, design with me. And she said, look, I've got a very specific need. I want to go to the market and buy tomatoes um, that are in, uh, in season at the local ferry building. And um, however, it's really hard for me to get around. I'm not very mobile. Um, and so one of the things that we um, did then is um, we partnered up with um, Stanford University, uh, who were running a design challenge, put the word out to the chapters and the uh, students, and came up with uh, ideas. And this is one um, idea that came from some local students to design a walker um, that would be both functional and fashionable um, and would help allow. June to, to go um, to the store and then come back, but also you know look good. And it's very important that we have this element of you know, it's got to look stylish uh, as well as be functional. And this so this idea sort of um, of introducing a new concept that, by the way, then won uh, the competition uh, and allowed you know essentially June to sort of get her get her wish of, of a really nicely designed walker that helps her get get what she wants. So it illustrates a couple of things about aging 2.0 which is bringing a broad network uh, into play um, and then focusing on <clears throat> quality uh, of life of older people that can be improved with innovation and design. And so our mission, Aging 2.0, is supporting innovators, taking on the biggest challenges uh, and opportunities uh, in aging. Um, and the way that we do that is we're building this international interdisciplinary and this generational network uh, with um, many corporate members uh, in many chapters in different countries. Um, it's run as a for-profit um, company. Uh, we have a, a US base. Uh, we have local chapters run by volunteers. 
um, because we are a very much a social enterprise. Um, we very much believe in doing, you know, for for profit and for purpose. Um, and this approach of combining um, sort of innovation, uh, technology, design, um, but doing it for a social good is something that we're very excited about. And um, a sort of building building a community of, of people also interested in that in that topic. So very quickly, um, in terms of the way that we run, we have um, programs for our corporate partners and for our chapters, and we run a global startup uh, competition that identifies companies and startups around the world doing really interesting work and um, elevates them onto the stage uh, of a conference uh, we call Optimize at the end of uh, the year in November uh, in San Francisco. So. So this idea of using the network, finding ideas from wherever they happen to be, is something that I think we can all um, you know, benefit from because it's happening in other areas. It's happening, uh, a lot of the crowdfunding uh, models that we're seeing where people develop these concepts um, and then uh, get them funded and get them scaled. It's something that I think we're gonna be starting to see <clears throat> in aging. And, and the good thing is there's so many, interesting, so many people interested in the topic that wanna help and get involved. Uh, we're now up to about 60 chapters in different countries, uh, about 20 countries, and uh, going at about one a week. And these chapters are, uh, have the uh, requirement to organize local events, run, get local volunteers involved, and in particular, find out what's new and what's interesting in different um, areas. Because the good thing is that all the uh, innovations that we see that spread out around the world, there's no one center of innovation and aging. It's a, it's a universal uh, approach, and I think this is why I think the the IFA uh, is uh, approach is so useful as well. That we really need to have a global uh, conversation and create uh, ideas and best practices and, and and share perspectives from different uh, people around the world. Um, the conference at the end of the year, as I mentioned, is a way we gather the the community to come together. Uh, and some of the partners, just have mentioned the the folks that are working together with us. Um, uh, on the sort of corporate side are all focused on uh, innovation uh, from different perspectives, both from the aging and senior care world, but more recently, uh, Project Gamble, for example, has just joined, uh, and more in the, sort of the, the B2C, the consumer side of things uh, as well. So now I sort of wanted to uh, get in and spend you know, the rest of the time really uh, exploring the, the, the challenges and uh, in particular, the, the, the focus areas uh, around functional ability and, and, and age-friendly environments. Um, so specifically, when we took a step back uh, and last year and said, you know, what are the, the most important topics of innovation um, in aging? The question that we asked ourselves is sort of, you know, how do we sort of structure the environment to, you know, more effectively um, create a, um, a a way for everybody to to access um, the ideas and innovators that are out there. And, and the good thing is that there's so many innovators uh, moving uh, extremely quickly, doing lots of things, um, but that is also quite overwhelming. And many of the partners that we speaking to, specifically people working in uh, aging and senior care, um, were getting inundated with many companies coming in uh, from different perspectives and saying, look, you know, this is our idea. We want to have some new technology to improve um, uh, engagement or improve um, you know, cognitive um, uh, tr uh, some uh, tool for uh, tracking people with cognitive decline or whatever it might be. And a lot of the time, people are sort of speaking past each other. And so we developed the grand challenges uh, based on two things. One was what are the uh, topics that are most interesting from the perspectives of improving the lives of older people. Um, and so we did a, uh, a lot of work with our chapters and our corporate partners and older people and our advisors and identified the, the topics that really potential to move the needle in terms of older people's quality of life. Um, and then we also looked at the topics of what are the areas that are um, ways in which we can improve uh, we can have uh, the innovators uh, get involved because there are some areas that are more conducive to startups and technologies and others uh, are, are others not so much. And so these 12 topics came uh, you know, came out in, in, in a sort of set of iteration uh, set of discussions. Um, the way that we are 
uh, putting them together really is to think about it in sort of three phases, if you like, in terms of innovation ambitions, where, you know, on the one hand, we can sort of start off with more of today's care environment and improving care, um, so the systems of care, I mean, sort of the caring um, topics around care coordination, you know, helping people transition um, from, you know, one care setting to the other, whether it's from in-home to a hospital, still nursing, rehab, uh, keeping track for people, and also bringing the family uh, in together. Um, uh, care operations relate to you know the, the mechanics of how the systems work, uh, how um, staffing uh, is done to be more effective, how we can improve um, medication management, which is uh, you know, one of the biggest um, concerns um, of people both living independently and also uh, in communities. Um, and then remote care delivery, how to sort of take the best advantage of the new technologies that make it easier for uh, people to connect to, for example, uh, we've seen quite a few technologies around um, rehab uh, using sort of three-dimensional uh, sensors to keep people, um, to allow people to know if they're doing the right, uh, the moves uh, in the right way uh, according to their sort of rehab plan. Um, then on the sort of thriving side, this is really moving to where um, we want to you know, enable the the next sort of generation vision where you know, aging itself is um, uh, much more than a, which is often characterized as, as a medicalized condition, you know, health uh, focused and really much more about a whole body, uh, whole person um, topic. And so a lot of the issues here around um, connecting uh, the social determinants of health. So moving people um, uh, moving the people around um, communities, personal mobility, and also you know uh, movement in um, around the uh, around towns and community in terms of transportation, um, connecting uh, engagement of purpose. You know we consistently hear uh, how important um, uh, the social isolation is as a as a risk factor, um, and then the lifestyle and daily living are you know, products and services uh, design to help people uh, improve you know, the quality of lives, their lives, um, and have a uh, much sort of richer um, experience, giving them autonomy and agency. And then on the reimagining side, we're still really saying, look, there are some topics here that uh, are really um, complicated and, and, and difficult and need to be addressed uh, as a much more of a societal conversation where we need to start saying, okay, um, how do we sort of change our approach uh, as a society to get um, to, 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 to rethink some of these quite complicated issues? So, for example, um, you know, financial wellness, um, getting people to have conversations around um, financial uh, security, financial planning, um, new sort of approach to working in later life, but also then having those conversations within the same context uh, where people would have. Um, the uh, healthcare planning conversation. Um, uh, the family caregiving um, strikes uh, us as really important where a lot of people are struggling um, you know, to look after people uh, in their homes and not necessarily getting the support uh, recognition um, that, they, that they need to do that um, to, to support them. Uh, and so we're seeing folks like ARP do a really good job of of uh, documenting uh, the importance and the impact of this in the economy. And then we're seeing um, startups uh, come uh, provide products and services that uh, effectively support um, those people who are you know, in need of um, additional help, in particular the, the, the caregivers themselves. Um, and then the cognitive health um, and end of life, you know, two very tricky uh, topics. Obviously, haven't seen a lot in the way of progress. Um, around dementia, but there's a lot of innovation in the um, you know, the non-pharmacological approaches around uh, cognitive health um, and dementia, um, and in particular on, on the music side and the pet therapy, um, and then end of life, uh, a lot of need to kind of recreate um, sort of the the pact that we have in society about. Um, uh, agency uh, and understanding people's wishes, planning, uh, making allow people to to, to to plan ahead of time, um, but also um, 
to taking a lot of the you know, inspiration from you know, Atoll uh, Dewandi's um, uh, recent book um, to try and sort of rethink the way that we uh, treating uh, treating society, uh, treating older people in society, and sort of resetting uh, a lot of the a lot of the way that we um, we think about end of life and, and and essentially understanding conversations in a very different way that we've uh, than we've had before. So. Um, so from those uh, sort of high-level topics, uh, what we can do is then sort of pull out a few um, innovations that we're seeing that represent sort of uh, you know novel uh, breakthroughs, but also sort of bigger trends. Um, and so you know, in the uh, the functional ability side, we're seeing a lot of people focus, um, develop new products and services um, that combine the form and the function. So a little bit like I mentioned um, earlier. Where we've got um, people who are uh, coming out with products that, um, you know, for the, for the walkers that are that look good and also do their job. Um, there's uh, uh, Care Predict and, and WiseWare, the so two companies um, that uh, providing uh, trackers that um, look stylish and people actually, um, you know, don't uh, immediately feel like they are um, you know, some sort of. Uh, being being given a, an ugly um, tracker that could be you know, either they don't want to wear or they're embarrassed about wearing, um, and building sort of more fashion uh, into this pro- process. And and I think we're seeing some really interesting concepts coming out of design students um, and having you know, stu- uh, younger people who are sort of design ethos um, active. Uh, it's, it's been one of the things that the, the Stanford Design Challenge has done uh, a good job in. Um, this uh, razor um, I wanted to mention, it comes from uh, Potter and Gamble. Uh, I'm not sure if the um, video, uh, I can click it, I'm not sure if the audio will play, um, so I wouldn't necessarily, uh, I don't think we'll, we'll watch it now, but the um, it's a really powerful um, uh, way in which we can, uh, I just recommend that you look at that uh, afterwards. That you, um, for the first time, uh, PNG sort of is saying that nobody has designed a, a, a razor in the past um, for a caregiver. There's thousands of razors, but none of them have been designed to improve, um, making it easier for caregivers to look after uh, other people. And this is just is uh, an indication of where a company like PNG is starting to say, you know what, this is a really important market. Uh, we've got an opportunity to. You know, Create new products and services um, that you know, help people um, and position this not as just a, a one-off product and services, but a not not a one-off product, but a much broader um, approach to helping um, improve the business ecosystem uh, yeah, more generally. Um, the the next uh, sort of part of this, um, I wouldn't be able to you know, talk about improving functional ability without um, mentioning you know, the work that Amazon. Uh, is doing um, around the uh, the Echo. Um, a lot of people are excited for this as a new model for uh, interactions uh, to help older people um, get online, get connected, and have uh, services delivered to them. So you know, this is on the one hand, the Amazon Echo is um, a uh, device that has um, you know, an inbuilt speaker and voice interface. Uh, the, the, the new ones now come with a camera, uh, and so you can yeah, drop in to people and see how they're doing. But the important thing is that we're seeing a bit of a parallel, like we saw with um, the uh, Apple App Store, where there's now over so 15,000 um, skills, which are the name for the apps for the uh, Alexa, um, for the for the Amazon Echo, which uh, developers are using. You know, whether it's music side, whether it's um, uh, podcasts, or whether it's the weather, or even to control lighting around homes, uh, where you have this much easier way uh, to provide, uh, to put, get input uh, information in and get information out. Um, so you, you, we are starting to see people say, "Hey, you know, Alexa, where are my keys?" And then the keys will start to beep, or "Hey, Alexa, you know, what's the weather like outside?" Or "Hey, Alexa, turn down the lights." Um, so this idea of bringing you know, technology uh, in a very sort of person-centric way into the home, uh, and then it's frankly getting rid of technology. And a lot of people have been trying 
with devices, with keyboards, um, and it's quite complicated, um, but actually we're finding it easier um, to have people interact uh, just with voice um, commands. Um, and so we're going to be seeing a lot more there things in that era. Um, you know, robotics um, are you know well you know well understood in terms of you know what what we can um, how things we can potentially improve um, lives of older people and stay in independence. Um, so sort of three in particular that I thought worth mentioning. Um, Catalia um, is a uh, sort of person centric um, device. It looks it looks a little bit like a uh, a little person that is uh, really focused on medication management. That's really the problem they're looking to solve. Um, and they're um, partnering up with pharmaceutical um, companies um, to help make sure that um, people you know, keep track of their uh, medication uh, in their homes. Uh, Intuition Robotics has just um, raised uh, quite a lot of um money and they are about to launch sort of in q4 this year where it's a very sort of intuitive um device that um is a bit it once you see sort of the video it sort of reminds you uh of, of a person that sort of combines you know the, the features of the person that has sort of a personality um and then it has a screen so it, 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 it interacts with it and then somewhat so on, on jibo uh again it's a device that has um, a certain cuteness um, that's quite interesting when people are testing uh, these devices they really get a sense of you know personal connection um, and emotional attachment to you know what is clearly a, a robot it's not trying to look like a human um, but this idea of having a device that is um, a, uh, a robot that is starting to, to connect emotionally I think is a breakthrough and that's what we haven't seen up until now where creating a, sort of a social connection um, and having a robot that can be um, uh, trusted um, that can be uh, often we see people confide uh, in robots and artificial um, intelligent agents uh, quite yeah, more than they would you know to, to real people um, I think it's going to be a useful way to extend um, you know the care um, care setting and have people um, triage, for example, um, in terms of if there are concerns that people that can start to test um, uh, by listening to the voice, whether um, somebody is, uh, for example, Parkinson's, uh, there's a Parkinson's test um, where you can tell by listening to the voice whether somebody is getting worse, whether they need additional support. Um, there are uh, artificial intelligent um, bots with the uh, small um, cameras that can look at um, your face and facial recognition and actually tell uh, if you're in pain uh, or if you're lying uh, to a question about did you take your medication. So it's quite interesting uh, to see the the the, um, the way which technology is going to be evolving. The other part of robots is worth mentioning is just the slightly more pedestrian stuff around the house um you know house cleaning um it's, it's been quite well known uh, for a while things like Roomba but um the way in which um we can start to automate some of the cars you know even a dishwasher you know, it could be considered a robot where I think the, the the trick for the industry and the innovators is to get rid of the the boring things and allow um family and the caregivers to do Things that they are interested in and are good at, and uh, not necessarily they don't people that they don't want to be spending all the time um, you know, washing the floors when they go and spend an afternoon with their um, their older relatives, um, but sort of spending time in more engaging ways. And this, is, I think, is the direction that we're this thing with the with the uh, the robotics uh, take us into the, into the future. Um, and then a, another one to mention is this um, trend that we're seeing around wrapping um, services around the individual. Um, a lot of people, you know, not necessarily old people, but uh, all of us, uh, as we're confronted with you know, a large number of new products and services, people are saying, hey, we're gonna help you stay independent and stay in your home, and we're gonna automate your home, and we're gonna give you, you know, smart um, uh, curtains and smart lights and smart TVs. Um, we quickly get into a very complicated um, overwhelming uh, 
system uh, of remote controls and logins and usernames and passwords and uh, plugs and the idea of creating a, a layer to um, uh, bring all the different services together um, to allow people to more effectively you know, manage um, the things that matter to them. Um, I think it's really interesting. Uh, Cubigo is a Belgian company that we know that is doing something similar um, where the idea is that each person has a different set of needs. And I think this is what we're seeing um, some of the more interesting areas in innovation happen where we're bringing personalized services to that individual. Um, it's not just a one size fits all where you know, everybody gets um, you know, the same product or the same service, um, but we're starting to see some personalization. And this really plugs into you know, the mega trends around um, the baby boomers and uh, the baby boomers have always had things their way. And this is now the promise of technology is to be able to deliver personalized services at scale and how people have, uh, whether it's local transportation, uh, food delivery, handyman services, uh, remote care, uh, rehab, um, the services that they need uh, brought together uh, into an aggregated uh, approach like this is something that I'm really excited about and it's going to be, um, we're going to see more of uh, in the future. <coughs> So moving into the age-friendly environments, and so this <clears throat> this map more to the livable communities uh, challenge that um, we're, we're exploring, and there's a lot um, of new innovations around uh, personalized transportation. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Lyft and Uber have um, been um, doing uh, a, a, a good job in creating. Uh, on-demand uh, personalized services. A lot of the time, though, it has been um, uh, quite complicated to uh, access them for older people, uh, not just because they don't necessarily have the, uh, the smartphone and download the app and, and connect the credit card and all those things, but um, just the sort of the, the, the physical you know, act of um, uh, managing the um, managing the uh, the interface uh, on the phone is also uh, challenging, and so <clears throat> we're seeing a few companies. Go Go Grandparents is another one that allows uh, people to just phone up uh, in a regular basis on a telephone number, and then to um, for the, the service provider then to connect um, the services, and either connect into Lyft or Uber, or provide um, you know, additional service uh, options. <clears throat> the other piece on the, the complexity for Older people up until now is the um, a lot of the drivers are necessarily designed uh, <clears throat> for helping people um, get in and out of the car. Um, they don't necessarily have the, the skills or expertise or training, uh, and so a, a number of these companies are giving dedicated training and support um, to help uh, older people to get in and out uh, of the car. For example, door through door service um, rather than just sort of pick up and drop off. Uh, so this kind of gives people a whole new set of uh, options to, <coughs> excuse me, to allow them to um, to connect um, and be more active uh, in the community. Um, and then similarly, beyond um, just transportation, we're seeing the services joining joining together. Um, so, for example, um, you know, Lyft uh, has done a, um, a partnership with CareLinks, which is a platform. To um, provide uh, care, um, carers, um, family caregivers, and it it allows um, the, the family caregiver to you know, call a lift or call a, a car from within the the app itself, and so it's much more integrated. Uh, and this idea of you know combining um, services and partnering up with different services to um, allow uh, people to have um, more of the sort of social, less social determinants of uh, health, their needs met. Uh, it's something that we're seeing quite a, quite a bit. Uh, Meals on Wheels um, is starting to partner up. Um, they're doing a pilot project out in Baltimore where they are um, collaborating with um, case managers and um, uh, <coughs> um, people delivering. Um, for them, it's a more than a meal, they have sort of social engagement and they have 
um, have food delivery, and then they uh, also have a case manager to have an oversight and see if they can tell if something is going on, if something needs to be done. Um, and so together, we're creating a much more you know, joined up approach of uh, what the needs are uh, of people and what are the service providers that can then meet those needs again in a, in a personalized way. Um, I wanted to mention the uh, the new models for uh, living that we're seeing. Um, so a couple in particular, Silver Nest um, and the Freebird Club. Um, Freebird Club's out of Ireland, Silver Nest is um, <clears throat> in uh, Colorado, where they are allowing people to, um, essentially it's an Airbnb model um, designed for older people. Um, but the thing about this is that it's more, uh, Focused and um, uh, tested, um, all the, so the, the interaction is based on uh, older people. Um, the, the interface is, is much more um, designed and and uh, friendly uh, for older people. And then the, the service environment, the service experience is is more social and allows people to connect with each other. Again, so, uh, addressing the social engagement and isolation piece. Um, room to care um, down in Florida. You know, something similar, but a bit more focused on sort of um, disrupting the assisted living model. So it's a smaller, um, smaller um, size, um, uh, like a better assisted living, but providing um, some care and services as well uh, at, at a lower price point. Uh, and then Minka is the new uh, offering from Bill Thomas, um, from who was the founder of the Greenhouse Project, who's developing these sort of small homes that uh, can be clustered um, and, it, and uh, has, can have technology and health services delivered to them um, that are much more manageable for uh, people to live uh, independently and then have um, care, uh, care and care uh, caregivers uh, provide services to them uh, as needed. Um, and then the you know, social and intergenerational living, I think we're seeing, I thought this picture was quite cute, where um it's, it's happening around the world uh, the dutch seem to be <clears throat> at the forefront but lots of different models um are emerging where we can see more people um you know, opting uh to live in intergenerationally um the benefits obviously on the student side um that they they get a um they're, they're much lower um rent um and but they also then um get uh, to interact older people and people sort of beyond their sort of traditional social circles um, and then older people again you know find it more in interesting and engaging um, so this is I think a model where we're seeing more people um, can do this on an you know, ad hoc basis um, but I think this is recognition that you know today's um, model uh, of uh, senior care can uh, result if we're not careful with um, sort of ghettoization and stigma and people being separated and I think uh, we're seeing a lot of logic in bringing new models of you know city center um, living people working and living together um, uh, in a in a community in an urban environment of all ages uh, interacting uh, with each other and so both sides benefiting from that shared experience um, and then um, finally on the um, uh, the family caregiver side, <coughs> we're seeing um, new tools and uh, services to help uh, family caregivers. Uh, Unforgettable.org um, is a uh, company out in the UK that is um, the first one that's created a retail presence for products and services for um, caregivers, uh, people with dementia, and it's curated a, a group of um, products that um, are specially designed and um, uh, validated and then people have a community uh, site so they can discuss uh, the topic and they can discuss the key issues um, and then the sites uh, like Daughterhood is one um, in the US where they're providing services and support for caregivers um, and you know, personalized uh, emails, um, there's tips and tricks, um, there's ways in which um, sort of we're seeing more recognition and support of um, caregivers as a, a vital part of the, um, the economy and the, um, 
the role of keeping people uh, independent uh, in their communities and so making uh, age-friendly environments uh, more than just about um, the old adult themselves, but a much sort of broader, um, you know, it takes a village uh, approach. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, so the final then, um, I wanted to leave some time for, for questions, is um, ways to get involved. Um, so really there's a whole uh, opportunity um, uh, where we can sort of have uh, individual events. Um, there's local chapters, as I said, there's about 60 um, people can get involved there. Um, we would love to hear about needs that older people have. Uh, if you know um, about an unmet need that we think that could be elevated to I guess, startups involved, it's really interesting. It's always good to hear what people need, and it's always good then to test um, uh, old, test ideas and older adults. So people, in my experience, um, love to get engaged and to test new ideas and provide feedback. Um, chief elder officers, um, I think almost every company should have one uh, or two or three because they uh, a way to make sure we are designing with, not for. Um, uh, we at Aging2 are having a, an event in um, uh, Taipei uh, in October. It's our first one in Asia um, and our big event in San Francisco. So opportunity to connect uh, with others um, and then really sort of just have uh, opportunity to to, to get engaged with startups um, and building that bridge um, between um, startups and old adults. It's not something that we have the monopoly on. Everybody can do it and get engaged. And uh, it's a really interesting opportunity to connect these two worlds that haven't necessarily been put together uh, before. So I think with that, I will sort of turn it back to Jane, open it up for, for questions um, and uh, see if there's any uh, questions at this stage. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I will get the question started uh, by inviting my colleague Kate McCray to um, ask a couple of questions. Kate, uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Jessica. Um, I guess the first question that I have for you, Stephen, was I found it really interesting uh, when you're talking about all the transportation options that are currently becoming available for older people. However, I was just wondering, have you heard of many that are offering um, any special options for people with mobility devices like walkers or wheelchairs because I know at least here in Toronto most of the cab companies do have larger vehicles that can accommodate those kind of things but I didn't know if you knew of any of anything like Lyft that are offering those options for people. Yeah that's a great point and so far there's been a bit of a um, I think middle ground that hasn't been filled where you have the you know, expensive, slow moving uh, um, you know, tra transport, um, you know, community provided transport, which you know, does have um, those options. But then so far, it hasn't been a big focus on um, from the uh, companies like Lyft and Uber. But I, I know for a fact that that's changing. I think they're starting to, <clears throat> they're starting with um, sort of sensitivity training and um, coaching the drivers. Um, I think one of the things is it's about the um, the cars and what cars are available in terms of uh, when something is able to, to use, um, to be used for uh, wheelchairs. Um, but I don't know if they rolled it out yet, but I know that some, um, both Lyft and Uber have options where you can pick um, a, I don't know if they rolled it out in all cities, and it's available in some cities, but you can pick certain cars that uh, only, you know, that have um, the ability to take a wheelchair. Uh, but it, it's coming. Um, but I think it's one of those things that, again, it's, it's a benefit to be in a big city, whereas I think the challenge that we get <coughs> is um, living in rural areas where you may not have um, these on-demand services, which is just not the, um, not the numbers. <coughs> um, we're seeing um, uh, Centennial Colorado uh, just did a uh, recent um, test where they were um, providing um, a uh, support for um, people to, to use Lyft to help to get them to the local, if they weren't near a tram or a train station or a bus stop. And I think that to me is quite an interesting area where once we get cities involved to say, hey, you know what, we can start to 
guarantee a certain number of rides or provide a source of demand, then companies like Lyft and Uber and Envoy, which is a, another startup um, and others, will go, you know what, it's actually worth us um, making the cars available. And this is when the cities can say, you know what, we need a certain percentage of them to be suitable for taking wheelchairs and to um, you know, have um, uh, solutions for people with more, um, you know, with, with, with higher acuity needs. And so I think there's actually a really op- interesting opportunity for us, you know, as, you know, the community uh, to have conversations saying, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll support that and we'll provide some uh, solutions, but you need to also, as the as companies, um, deliver. Um, and, and I think the market will then uh, respond. And I think right now there hasn't been a good interface good discussion between those providers uh, and, and the needs of the community, and I think that will change. Okay, thank you. Uh, we actually have a question from Dr. Barrett now. Uh, she asked, so you've been talking about all these really wonderful uh, technological advances, but Dr. Barrett was wondering, can technology detract from a person's need and wish to maintain their own personal well-being, in your opinion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I think that's happened, that happened at all ages. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I find when I'm on Facebook, uh, I kind of I lose hours, uh, and then I end up sort of being more, um, you know, miserable at the end of it. And so I think it's it's quite a um, it's quite a, it's quite a difficult balance. Uh, I think up in the in the past, there's been quite a few um, people. I remember a large technology company um, when I was working in the mobile world um, about ten years ago was testing a new. Uh, they're very excited about their new um, connected photo frame, which would allow um, older people to uh, have a photo frame that would then the family members would pop up and communicate uh, by photo frame. And so there's still startups that are doing things like this. And what they discovered when they tested it out was that family members would then visit less often. Um, the kids, they go, oh, we'll just, we'll just do it, a virtual drop-in. And um, that, I think, would be dangerous because, you know, they're driving more social isolation. So I think technology is, you know, is always neutral. It's how we, uh, we implement it. I'm more excited about the technologies that can be um, helpful to nudge us in the right direction. So for example, let's have uh, technologies that show when somebody is, is not being active uh, or they are potentially at risk of uh, being isolated um, or are sort of essentially uh, let's get technologies that are doing the stuff that we don't want to do uh, to allow us to have time to do the things that we do want to do. So I think there is room for you know high tech, high touch solutions, but the the way we need to address that is make sure that the technologies um, are sort of designed with the older adult and not for us to think that there's going to be one solution for everybody um, because that's just uh, that's never going to work. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, we have an a, 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 pardon me, an attendee question. Um, the question is, what role do you see for research, both basic and applied, in innovation in aging? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. We just had a um, uh, an, at the IAGG. I, I suspect many people on the line would have uh, seen at that event um, in San Francisco, where. We did, we worked with them and with A12 um, and uh, a few other organizations to, to run a pitch event. Uh, and these were startups that were looking for uh, collaboration with academic um, organizations to, um, to sort of test their ideas um, and essentially to have a, a, a more robust conversation a lot of the time about the ROI. Uh, most of the startups that we we're tracking about 3,000 startups around the world, uh, and we have seen the the startups. It's quite easy for them to create a concept, to, to put a nice PowerPoint um, slide deck together, and then you know maybe raise a bit of funding and to create a, a prototype. But what we haven't seen yet is enough really interesting um, startups of scaling up beyond the initial pilot stage. And you know, here I would sort of shout out to Agewell um, again in, uh, in another um, Toronto-based uh, company where organization where they 
they're doing a really good job of, of making that connection and they're using a very rigorous uh, academic approach to say, okay, does this work? Um, a bit like in, in a way, you know, we saw um, drugs uh, and the pharmacological, uh, the pharmaceutical approach sort of went through uh, a bunch of research, figured out what works, what doesn't. You know, I think there needs to be a, it's not going to be, we don't want to spend a billion dollars to do research to launch a product because we know that it works in every scenario. Um, but I think there is a, there's a, a bigger role to play for um, the researchers to help validate ROI um, and validate you know, impact and effectiveness. To provide also be really helpful would be to do a repository of, sort of what works. You know, we, we're seeing people get stuck again and again doing the same things that have not worked in the past. And I think we could do a better job uh, of sharing uh, perspectives of um, making sure we know what works and what doesn't. Um, and then one more thing I think would be interesting would be to realize that a lot of the things um, that are going to be impacting the lives of older adults are um, what I sort of mentioned here around the social determinants of health, where are, it's not just one intervention, it's not just food delivery, but it's food delivery with social connection, with remote care, with a handyman that can improve the life, uh, so improve the, um, make sure there are no throw rugs or there's uh, the banister needs fixing. And what I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't yet seen on the research side <clears> or <throat> academic side is a good way that we can sort of wrap all these interventions up and then test the effectiveness of them as a whole rather than just saying, you know, wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't it be good to just isolate the impact of delivering a, uh, a, a, a pet, a pet cat for somebody to improve their, uh, themselves when they are uh, the quality of their life, uh, somebody with dementia, but actually say, you know what, this is all part of a system. And I'd love for the academics to help us think through how we can more effectively uh, measure um, systems change rather than just individual interventions. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is um, also from an, one of the attendees, and it's um, in a for-profit company, um, how do users afford innovations such as the ones you've been talking about? Yeah, so I think maybe um, the question more about how to, you know, the cost of some of these new technologies. Yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's two pieces. One is, um, you know, us as a for-profit company, um, you know, the approach that we we take is we are trying to, we want that, this to be a scalable approach. We don't want to have to rely on um, government um, funds or foundation funds. We want to actually be self-supported, and that's the way that we we get our funding from you know, corporate partners who are interested in what the innovations are around the world, and so they pay our membership fees, um, and that's where we get most of our money. The uh, individuals who have access to, you know, the, to some of these things, obviously, um, these robots and you know, Amazon Echo cost $179. It's not cheap. Um, but I think the good thing is that we see um, that you know, technology itself is coming, you know, getting cheaper and cheaper uh, all the time. Um, the uh, approaches um, that we're taking are still being validated. So, for example, um, sensor networks uh, are getting cheaper and cheaper. And the data that they're getting is getting more and more accurate. And so we're in that stage where right now a lot of these things are being tested out and, you know, they're sort of shiny uh, like we see here uh, or they are, you know, still an edge case. Um, but, you know, going back to the previous question, if we can start to prove the ROI, then oh, the return on investment in investing in some of these things, I think we can be really interesting, especially around the health um, care system, where if you think about it, the uh, potential, especially in, in the U.S., there's you know, McKinsey and others estimate that to be around a, a trillion dollars of the three trillion dollars uh, of health care um, is spending is you know either waste or spent inefficiently or could be could be avoided and I think that's where I would like to see the main market um, come from and um, I don't want older people on um, with that much money to be you know spending their money on you know spending their savings on 
know, dubious technology that hasn't been validated. I would rather the healthcare systems um, spend the time to go. You know what? This, this is really going to make an impact. If we if we bring if we wire up people's homes, we have smart um, homes, we have or engaged uh, older people. We are going to predict um, earlier uh, if there's uh, health issues. We're going to get people help more quickly, and we're going to save money. I think that is a big area um, where we need innovation. We need smart thinking, and it's going to be as an outcome of the impact of health interventions that will be saving you know significant amounts of money. Then there will be new models. So, for Australia, I know is testing out. You know, consumer budgets where they're starting to give money to uh, individuals. And I think that will encourage the industry to be innovative, to show how they should be the ones to to take that money that the government is giving um, to individuals uh, in order to improve their lives. So I think the onus is on us as innovators um, to make the case um, that this money is well spent and not for older people to uh, invest their you know, hard won uh, and limited savings on uh, technology that hasn't been proven. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So um, this one's also from one of the attendees, and it's from someone in Taipei who asks, how can startups in the East connect with others elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, Taipei is, is actually perfect because we have a chapter in Taipei, um, and uh, if you go to the website, aging2.com slash local, uh, you'll be able to see all the different, um, <clears throat> all the different chapters. Um, and they are, you know, the web is, is a good way to connect. We just um, see the different uh, chapters we have right now. Adelaide, Shanghai, Tokyo, Bangkok, Singapore, Beijing, Taipei, Hong Kong, Tel Aviv. Um, our Asia Pacific chapters, and then um, you know, happy. I'm happy to also make connections if people want to uh, send me uh, an email, and um, we'll connect in uh, to connect them on with Stephen at Aging Two Thank you. Um, Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barrett for a couple of closing remarks. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you, Stephen. In closing, I want to reinforce and, and thank the World Health Organization, um, IFA and WHO are working in partnership to deliver these important webinars. Stephen, across the course of your presentation, you know, you helped us understand, you know, what Aging 2.0 is all about. But I think it really is just the beginning. Uh, it's the beginning of a conversation that we in the field of aging need to be having with you guys in the field of technology and startups. Um, you know, it seems to me that, you know, we are beginning to understand how technology can interplay with the person's functional ability. But I don't think we're sophisticated enough yet to appreciate, you know, how to measure the impact of this. You know, one of the other areas that you talked with, uh, talked about was around the, the public-private sector partnerships and you know, making the case. And I think it's very important for us not to be able to only make the case, uh, the business case, but what is the, the case for um, socialization. I think what came through to me also was, and you mentioned it several times, it was um, the technology and the human element. And that's one of the things that IFA really feels very strongly about in, in knowing and promoting the work of Aging 2.0. It's not just about the technology. It's about the user. It's about the older people informing the development. And it's also about how the technology and people around the technology can work to optimise the functional ability of the older person. In closing, I want to thank you once again, Stephen, for making the time and being open, you know, to being part of this webinar series. Uh, one of the IFA's signature actions is to bring Unlike together, and by bringing someone of your background and skills to the, the conversation, I know that many of our people on the call today will want to reach out to you and Aging 2.0. So thank you very much for your time. And to all of those attendee, attendees, thank you. 
I understand that um, the um, webinar will be recorded. Um, so I wish you all well and thank you very much for being part of this important webinar today. Right. Thank you.